If you have your Bible, let's go together to Isaiah chapter 59. I want to share a brief message uh, today with you. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and verse 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. I want to speak today a message titled, A Recipe for Revival. A Recipe for Revival. I do not claim to have a specific secret, but Prophet Isaiah has revealed a secret to us for a revival. And this message, I'm going to summarize it in one sentence. There's three secrets to revival. God's ear, God's hand, and a man's mouth. And in Isaiah 59, the Lord is saying to us, my hand is connected to my ear and my ear is connected to man's mouth when, means when man pray when man, man praise my name when man confess my word when man preach my word to other people it goes to my ear and my ear influences my hand and my hand begins to do the mighty work that it's supposed to do okay and so I want us to know that God's hand is influenced by God's ear. Can somebody say amen? amen? God's hand does not act on its own. God's hand does not act separately from God's ear. God's hand does not have a will of his own. God's hand does not save, heal and deliver just because it feels like saving, healing and delivering. God's hand acts, acts in proportion to God's ear. That means whatever comes into God's ear affects God's hand. And God says that my hand is not shortened to save. And then he goes in to connect that my ear is not dull to hear. He's saying that my hand is connected to my ear. My hand moves because my, he my ear hears. My hand acts because my, hear my ear gets influenced by the man's cry. God's hand does not act on accident. God's hand does not move just by chance. Revival is not mini, mini money. God going in heaven saying, bless him, not her. Bless him, not her. Revival is not God saying in heaven, just closes his eyes and just goes in. Like many people choose revelation from God when they open the Bible, just kind of whatever it falls. You just open the Bible, it's like this is from God. And then you find the scripture where it says Judas committed suicide. You're like never mind that is not how God brings revival that is not God how God brings saves people God does not close his eyes and just puts his finger and he landed in Lagos Nigeria oops it landed in Toronto Canada it landed in Redding California it landed in Pasco no the Bible says God's hand moves proportionally where his ear hears it's not an accident it's a consequence God's ear influences God's hand and the Lord tells us my hand nothing is wrong with it so for those people who are saying revival is not happening because something is with God's hand God is saying to us my hand is not broken my hand is not crippled my hand is not withered and my hand did not get weary or get tired and my hand did not get disconnected from my ear and he says I don't have an ear infection and my ears are not deaf my ears are not slow in hearing he says everything is good on my end revival is God's hand being influenced by God's ear and God's ear being influenced by our mouth there's nothing wrong with God's hand and there is nothing wrong with God's ear. God's hand is the factor of revival, not man's hand. Man's hand is short. We can preach to people, we can try to influence them, we can try to invite them to church and we ought to do all of these things. But there's something happens. A real revival is not when we all stretch our hands. It means when we all maximize our potential and maximize our gifts. Real revival is when God's hand is stretched. And what is impossible becomes normal. And what is supernatural becomes natural. And when you cannot reach people, God reaches out with his hand and touches their life. 
and God reaches out with his hand beyond the boundaries of time beyond the boundaries of limits of space and God begins to touch their life as some of you have seen the service that our group participated in Esco in Nigeria this time and you've seen where God supernaturally with his hand begin to move in people's lives from a lady who had cancer was 29 years of age and she already found her lot and the burial and God's mighty hand goes where the doctors couldn't even go and reach and takes that cancer out and brings complete healing God says my hand is not short God says my hand is not withered my hand nothing wrong with my hand it's ready for your use it's ready to move or if you saw the testimony of the lady who looked like a pirate because she was blind in one eye and how God's hand moved and brought healing to that lady or you saw one testimony that really blessed me when one young man received the the permanent visa or the the working visa or the educational visa don't recall now in another country and what happened is that everything was going well until that visa and his wallet was stolen by some people and they ran and he tried to chase them but he couldn't find them and so that's it now he's almost illegal and they're gonna kick him out of the country and he's praying to God because he went to that place where they gave him that place that the little car to stay in the country and they told him we cannot issue another one you have to go back to your country because that's it it's over and God in the dream shows him a place where they have his card he wakes up in the morning goes to that place and there is a grandma found that card and he says hey I'm just waiting for you here and hands him over that card and just tells us how God's hand is so much longer than your hand your connections might be limited by God's hand goes further and God says my hand is not short my hand can reach beyond whatever you think you cannot reach revival is when God gets his hand stretched revival is when God stretches his hand into the jail when God stretches his hand to the drug addict to the alcoholic to the stubborn to the atheist agnostic or just the religious person when God's hand is stretched but God says my hand is stretched when my ear is bothered when our mouth is open so there's no problem with God's hand there was this lady her name is Cheryl and at the age of 13 she was abused and because of that she started to bottle up a lot of sin and a lot of um, misbehavior which led to her um, sleeping around in high school which eventually led to after high school to um, danced in the clubs and she became a topless dancer in her local nightclub she was making good money and she was doing that to support her child and um, eventually she got married her husband was cheating on her and so she divorced him and she lived a very sinful and a very very empty life at one particular time she thought that the solution to her life is going to be uh, to start to consult some spiritual help and uh, all the Ouija boards and all the people who read your palms and they, they predict your future, they all presented not like witchcraft, they presented as good angels. And so she went in to get good angels to help her because she started to realize I cannot put my life together. I have a daughter, I don't have a husband, I'm working at this job that I don't really like but I just need to survive. I need to involve good angels to help me. And so she got those good angels to help her but they were not very good to her because after she got involved with her little lady who helped her with the good angels spooky things started to happen in her house you know and most of us we may say well I'm not afraid of dark but it's different when the dark is not the dark but it's demons she said I wasn't afraid of dark she says I worked at this job he says, I was not afraid of men I was not afraid of anything I was ruthless I was brutal but something started to happen in my house she said for no reason at night you know the TVs will start turning on, turning on the doors will begin to open and begin to just weird presence begin to just come over the halls and I will start seeing really scary images right in my face and as though like a horror movie he said ex she said except there was no a director there was no editor and there was no lighting effects and there was no music musical effects it was there in my house it got so severe that she started to contemplate suicide and she contemplated this for a lot for a long time but never really got into it until one night it went overboard um, just, just it spooked her so bad and she was reminded of how she was abused at 13 how her life means nothing and right there and then she took the razor and started to slice her wrist as she was about to do that she said to God if you are there you gotta do something and you gotta do something right now because the next minute and a half I'm gonna bleed to death and I'm going to die 
The interesting part is in that very instant second, her TV turns on. And there's a guy on the TV who says, you out there, look at me. That's all he said. TV turns off and comes a voice. It says, everything you want, you will want no more. I love you. Go up to the mountain and you will know my name. And that's it. In that very moment, the razor falls off. Something comes upon her and she realizes because this is a different voice. The first time in her life she's heard somebody says, I love you. She started to be overwhelmed with tears. She, she fell asleep. The darkness was gone. Next morning she packs her kids and decides to go up to the mountain. Here there is a church on the top of the mountain. And that church on the roof has word Jesus written on it. A woman at the end of her rope but not out of the reach of the hand of God. A topless dancer in a local nightclub, abused at 13, cannot put her life together. Nobody can influence her. Nobody can tell her of the way of salvation. She will not be receptive. Yet, God's hand is not out of reach. I want to tell you something. Every person you and I are praying for, every person we are believing for and any situation we can be in there is no pit God's hand cannot reach to there is no mountain top God's hand cannot reach you like we watched the testimony of the stuntman from Hollywood who helped you know with Rambo movies and all those very very famous movies it seems like oh he's so on the top God's hand can also reach there and God says my hand is influenced by my ear he says I move with my hand because I hear with my ear but the second truth I want you to get out today is that God's ear is influenced by man's mouth God's ear is influenced by man's mouth when men pray God hears when God hears God acts when we pray God hears when God hears God acts these are very simple truths. If we, with a childlike faith, perceive them into our heart, and we will make an, in our heart a statement of faith, I believe my God will hear my prayer. And when we, He will hear my prayer, He will act based on my prayer. This is what is needed to see a revival. And a revival when somebody gets saved, a revival when somebody gets healed, a revival when somebody gets freed from drugs, or a revival when somebody's marriage gets restored, a revival when somebody finds their way when they lost their way, a revival for our home groups, a revival for our church, a revival for your personal life, for your personal relationships. This happens when your mouth is active, God's ear is active, and God's hand is active. God's hand will do what his ear will tell him and God's ear will hear what you will let him know about. Amen. Satan's goal is to shut your mouth. He cannot stop God's ear from hearing you and he cannot stop God's hand from obeying its ear. Satan is not powerful enough to mess and disconnect God's hand from God's ear and he cannot stop God from hearing you. The only thing that he could do is he could stop you from talking to God. That's why we read in Isaiah 59 verse 1 verse 2 and if you read verse 3 and down you will see that the people of God, God says that my hand is not shortened to save, my ear is not heavy to hear but he says your sins have disconnected you from me. And you're like, okay, I heard about that. But if you read lower, you will find out what kind of sins. You see that these people started to lie. So their mouth is filled with perverse things. Their mouth is filled with gossip. Their mouth is filled with cursing. Their mouth is filled with lying. Their mouth is filled with so many things. Their mouth is not filled with prayer. Their mouth is not filled with praise. And their mouth is not filled with proclaiming. And their mouth is not filled with preaching. And so there is a disconnect be between man's mouth and God's ear. And therefore there is disconnect between God's ear and God's hand. Satan wants to zip your lip. 
He wants to muzzle your mouth. He wants to mute your tongue. He wants to stop your mouth because he understands that the secret of the change in your life is when you open up your mouth and you begin to pray to God. God's ear has no other thing but to hear you and when God hears you, God begins to act on your behalf. He cannot stop God's hand. He cannot stop God's ear but there is something he has an access to and that is to your mouth. And if Satan will use sin, if he will use distraction, he will use tiredness, he will use busyness for one simple thing just to cause you not to pray. And I want you to know this, that a sinning man will stop praying and a praying man will stop sinning. Amen. Amen. A sinning man will stop praying. So if Satan will cause you to sin, he knows you will stop praying. You will stop praising. You will stop preaching. But if he cannot stop you from praying, if he cannot stop you from praising, something is going to happen. You are going to stop sinning. You are going to stop doing that thing that you were doing before that caused you to stop away from God. That is the Satan's trick. His goal in actuality, there's four things that you can do with your mouth that really can change your life. Four things that can you, you can do with your mouth that really can revolutionize your life. And these four things are simple. You know them. They all start with four P's so they will easily to remember. It's prayer, it's praise, it's proclaiming and it's preaching. Praying means talking to God. Praising means worshiping God. Proclaiming means you declare God's word over your life. Means you declare God's truth over your situation. Means you face the devil and you tell the devil, knock it off, get behind me. Proclaiming means instead of complaining, you proclaim. And preaching means you open your mouth, not just to talk about people, not just to gossip, but to share the good news of salvation to people's lives so their lives will be changed for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? We see a Peter with Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and the Bible says that Jesus is about to go to be crucified. Jesus understands the complexity of the situation. He understands the greatest temptation is about to happen with Jesus, with Peter and all of the rest of the 11 disciples. And Jesus tells the rest of the 11 disciples let's go together and we are going to take time to pray. We're going to take, get time to pray to really see God's face, to get on our face before God. And Jesus is praying. I want you to notice that Jesus is tired. I want you to notice it's night. And all the disciples they fall asleep and Jesus was awake praying. He was not awake praying because he was a superman. He was not awake praying because he was more spiritual. He was awake praying because prayer was a priority to him unlike to the disciples. Most people do not open their mouth in prayer for this reason. Tired. I know how many times I have said no to prayer for this reason. Don't feel like today. I will do it tomorrow. And somehow I feel like people who can pray and pray constantly, fervently, in faith, passionately and consistently, they are somehow superhumans. Jesus wasn't superhuman. Jesus felt tiredness just like Peter. The difference between Peter and Jesus is Jesus also knew that just about three hours from now that I'm going to be facing the greatest temptation and for me to get through that I need some power from God. He knew that it was important and it was a priority. People who brush their teeth are not superhuman. People who brush their teeth on a consistent basis are not super powerful. They feel the same thing every person feels. I don't want to brush my teeth. Why do they do it? Because they're convinced in their, in their mind it's a priority. You know that half of the world don't brush their teeth? You know that a lot of the world don't even have a toothbrush and they don't even know what to do with the toothpaste? And they live and they think they think it's fine you may say how can you live it's fine when you open your mouth and it's gonna smell so bad they don't think that that's exactly how Jesus looks at us and me and says how can you live your life without prayer you may say well that's fine I'm just too tired I don't have time I don't even know that's for me Jesus says you know what it's better to live without breathing than to be a Christian without praying prayer must be a priority you must make a decision push away the tiredness and make it a priority anything you have priority for you always find time for and always find energy for period anything that's not a priority and anything that's not important to you you will always find excuses for and you will always have no energy for the interesting part is Jesus is there praying open his mouth oh father let your will be done let your will be done Peter over there sleeping sleeping three hours later Jesus in front of Pilate Jesus in front of Herod Jesus in front of the Jewish leaders silent in the moment of temptation they bug him they said, you're a heretic. You're a blasphemer. 
you did this I mean imagine somebody lying like that about you I mean you be like no no but Jesus sits there and says nothing and they pushed Peter's button they said Peter you've been with Jesus and you see Peter cussing you see people I mean cursing people out you see people say no I have never been with Jesus you say why couldn't Peter be tired during temptation to shut his mouth it's amazing how he was tired to pray but he wasn't tired to cuss and it's amazing when Peter closed his mouth during prayer he couldn't keep it closed during temptation this is the secret you must understand when you live your life opening your mouth in prayer you will have the power to close it when you get tempted and when you get attacked by the devil when you end up in the traffic when somebody is blackmail you, when somebody is trying to push on your buttons, when you're just really really tough, when your spouse didn't do what they want what they were supposed to do, when your kids did not do their chores and you feel like you wanted to open up the mouth and put everybody square and share a piece of your mind and then you will do what Jesus said. You will say nothing. Where does the power come from when you open your mouth in prayer? For those of you who have a big mouth and the only thing that's running in your life is your mouth, I want to give you a secret open your mouth in prayer you will have the power to keep it shut during temptation and some people you will keep your job if you keep your mouth shut and some people you will not get your brownie points with your parents lost if you just keep your mouth shut and some people so many blessings can happen in your life if you just zip your lip but you cannot zip your lip if you zip it during prayer you cannot keep both of the worlds open and Peter learned it very hard way if I want to be quiet during temptation I have to be loud during prayer if I want to be loud during prayer then I can be be quiet during the temptation so the first thing the Lord wants us to do is when we pray something begins to happen not only we are helped that we have the power not to commit sin with our mouth but we also we see people's lives change we see people's lives transformed but also I wanted to know that when we praise God something begins to happen we influence the ear of God to act on our behalf when we praise God we influence the ear of God to act on our behalf praise you know we I grew up in a very traditional more traditional church where praising God was all about the style and the style and as you saw in the video and this is not the way I grew up this is a little bit more um, contemporary to compare to how, the way I grew up and the most how most people grew up but for many people worship is about style worship is about either music it's either about clapping or not clapping it's about jumping or not jumping it's about shouting or not shouting it's about how many instruments you're allowed to have on the stage and worship is about style but it's not about God Satan will make you focused on the style of worship as long so it will cause you to miss the object of worship David one day was dancing before God so crazy and his wife she was sitting on the side of the window and the Bible says that she was looking at him and she's like I worship God but not like this and she was so offended with his style and when he came in instead of giving him a hug and says you know congratulations we made it this is awesome he says how foolish you were today in front of your servants and he says look 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 what you're doing you, you're dancing wrong you're not should you shouldn't be moving over there you're a king you should be more dignified care about your image your reputation and David looks so he says hey, you're a crazy woman he says the problem with you he says you're so obsessed with how to worship God that you missed who you're gonna worship he says I don't think about how I think about who and the how will take care of itself and the Bible says because she cared about the style she never praised God God never heard the praise and God's hand was never moved to open her womb to she will conceive a child if we become a church that worships God for God not for the style and worship divinity not dignity something is going to happen God is going to hear that and the Bible says God's hand is going to be moved can somebody say amen 
and God's hand is going to be moved when we come to worship here and you realize that it's not about the style it's about the object of our worship God's hand is going to be moved and God is going to bless us and God is going to use us and God is going to touch us it's not about the style it's about the object of our worship sometimes people come and says I didn't feel anything during this worship I did not like this worship since when was this worship about you I thought we were worshiping him so if you didn't like it great that wasn't for you in the first place the question is did he like it and if he liked it we're all happy and if you did not like it do not worry because it was not about you in the first place when you come and it's not your favorite song and not your favorite musician and not your favorite leader and not your favorite this and then the words are not there remember this is about the object not the style and when you are in love with the style you cannot get the hand of God moving why because you're not worshiping the object you're worshiping the style and that's why most of us the songs that you like on your itunes are mainly about the style not necessarily about object and it's good to like the style don't get me wrong it's good to sing professionally it's good so when you have all the instruments you have the flute you have the drums it's good when the worship leader really pumps you up it's good when the song makes you move makes you jump but at the end of the day rejoicing in worship and liking the style does not move the hand of god it's when I keep in front of my mind it's not about the song it's about the God it's not about the music it's about the creator and only then his ear hears that I make him the object of my worship his hand will begin to move can somebody say amen, amen. so do not be offended and do not get stuck with the style we're going to be praying for our people we're going to be praying for souls worshiping God proclaiming God's word and if we don't proclaim God's word we end up complaining about our situation amen I'm gonna finish on this story there was this lady Shelly is her name she is a daughter of a missionary family and they were in the other country her parents were missionaries uh, they were of Catholic descent and at the very early age from the age of six to the to ten she was sexually abused by somebody in the Catholic Church and she could never tell anybody and she was very very emotionally hurt the family moved from missionary field and at the age of 10 she finally got free from that because her family relocated they came to the United States the pain that she suffered and the, the abuse that she has experienced she never told anybody and never confessed to anybody and was very ashamed to talk about it to God and in the middle of school and in the high school she decided to throw herself in studies and extra curriculum courses get involved in music get involved in sports just so that she can keep herself busy she was a top honorary student everything was going well until she graduated from high school and her family sent her to a Christian University and something just happened all that junk she carried inside just went off the roof and she became in the university known as a cussing atheist no longer the the daughter of a missionary family no longer an excellent you know athlete an excellent student but a cussing atheist if somebody would even bring the name of God the name of the fact that she came from a missionary family she would just vomit all the cussing words she was just very vicious about it and but on inside she struggled though she had doubts she struggled deeply and like in the other story she started to take that out by spending a lot of time alone and then she slowly started to she was afraid of using drugs she was afraid of drinking but she wasn't afraid of cutting veins so she started to do that just to relieve her pain here's a student you know finishing her PhD missionary parents professing to be a cussing atheist but during the night during home she's there literally bleeding just so she can feel a relief and she decided to end her life in a very surprising way on her birthday she decided her university was a very tall building she decided on her birthday during the day when there was most students over there in the campus to cut her wrists and throw herself off of the building now here's American University these are our students these are our colleagues these are not people somewhere 200 years ago these are people in the 21st century who have a phone who have a car and who have a scholarship 
but who don't have God. So what she did is on her birthday, she, exactly like her plan, she cut her wrists and made her way to the top floor. As she's making her way to the top floor, the blood is dripping from her hands. It so happens that a student begins to walk across the hall and notices blood. And so this student, she was a Christian and they had a little Bible study in that little college. She begins to follow her and she sees a girl walking outside to the top floor. She stops her. She says, where are you going? He said, you're bleeding. She's like, no, never mind. I just need to get some fresh air. He said, you're not getting no fresh air. You're going to the bathroom with me. We're going to wash those hands. And because the Christian girl was not like, well, I don't want to offend her. She was a little bit bolder. She actually took her, ruined her plan took her to the bathroom. This girl fainted in the bathroom. She calls police. They put her in a suicide watch and they put her in a mental institution. She wakes up in a mental institution and it shocks her. Now here she is, educated, cussing atheist and they removed shoelaces from her shoes in the fear that she'll kill herself. And in that moment she started to say to God, if you are there, you gotta do something. But what she does not know is this girl who catches her, organizes in her Bible study for 10 days straight, every day, every one of them is praying for a few minutes for this Shelly. And they're interceding to God that while she's in mental institution, that God's hand is going to reach for her there and do something in her life. 10 days pass by and Shelly gets released from mental institution. The suicide watch is taken off of her record and the first person she meets is the same girl who stopped her from suicide. And she said, could you come to our Bible study? And well, what does Shelly say? Shelly says in her mind, no, but her lip says, yes, I will. Why? Because for 10 days there has been a hand that's working on her behalf that somebody's been praying for. She comes to the Bible study and she says, I grew up in a Catholic background. You know, I'm used to the different style of worship. She comes there and these are charismatic young people. It means they shout, they say amen, they get happy, they loud, they raise their hands, they cry. And she says, these are weird people. She sits there, she says, I'm not coming here again. These are weirdos, this is crazy people. And right before it's about to get over, the group leader says, Shelly, do you mind if you come in the middle and we pray for you? And she says, oh, of course, pray for me, big deal. She comes in there on that chair and she sits down. And as she closes her eyes, she tells this to God in a thought. If nothing happens, I am never, ever coming back to these crazy fanatics again. The moment she finished that thought, Holy Spirit's presence begins to just come upon her. And at first she felt, she said like ice cubes in the boiling water part by part of her personality started to melt and for all those years that everything she carried she started to release it through her tears and she started to weep weep and weep and this lasted for minutes when all of it was done she said i felt tons of bricks removed out of me she opens her eyes they lead her to jesus christ today she's a bible teacher and she's a worship leader at international house of prayer but it all started because God's ear was bothered by a group of Bible study students and moved God's hand to touch a girl named Shelly who was on suicide watch. I want to challenge us right now that every single home group to have people that we are praying for specifically, every home group, every one of us that we have people that we pray for daily every single day because revival is about the hand of God being influenced by the ear of God and the ear of God being influenced by the mouth of believers if we open up our mouth and we begin to say God I want you to move if we open up our mouth and we say God I praise you that you're gonna save this person if we open up our mouth and begin to say that my brother and my sister will serve the Lord if we open up our mouth and begin to share with people the good gospel of Jesus Christ something is gonna happen it's gonna influence the hand of God and the hand of God is gonna move mightily and save people's lives I have a friend who lives in Salem and um, well he's a friend on Facebook and he wrote to me last week a very interesting story he said that he applied for this job and he was dropping off the application as he's coming to drop off the application something happens is the office is closed and he's so upset he's like man why did this happen 
the next day he goes in to return the application as he returns the application he drives by and they have a bridge there in Salem where people sometimes would jump off the bridge for two reasons some would jump in for some grass over there I guess to you know kind of feel the the hype and other people actually would commit suicide so there's a young man that's standing on the edge of the bridge and he's driving by the next day and so he just hears, hears this whisper says you know pull over he pulls over and then the Holy Spirit puts it in his heart he says go talk to him he said well I don't want to go talk to him I mean he's I don't know what he wants to do and he overcomes the doubt he comes to him and he says hey uh, I see you having fun huh he said pray for me and this friend on Facebook he says pray for what he said I'm not here for fun he said I'm here because you know I I want to end my life pray for me he says yeah I'll pray for you and this Christian guy begins to converse with him begins to tell him about the love of God begins to tell him about the love of Jesus it so happens that this guy who stands there on the bridge after hearing it enough God begins to move on him jumps off and starts running away from the bridge and God saves his life instead of jumping over the bridge he runs from the bridge and God saves him God's hand was moved when one, one man's mouth was open I want to tell you something God's hand is going to move in our lives God's hand is going to save people and change people but something has to happen today open your mouth to pray for people pray for people specifically to pray for people strategically and to pray for people consistently open your mouth to praise God on their behalf and open your mouth to proclaim God's word over their life and let's open their, our mouth to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to share our testimony because the miracle of God in their life will depend on that like we saw in the school on this Sunday when one lady if I think from Texas who was a little bit blind and she was healed that one one service she testifies as she's testifying there's another lady sitting there who is blind also and as she hears her testimony her faith sprouts and she says if God did it for her God can do it for me as this anointing water was being sprayed for this second lady receives her healing and she says when I was sitting there my faith was challenged and encouraged because I heard a testimony of this lady who was healed and I was listening to this testimony and I'm thinking what would happen if this American lady who was healed said well praise God I'm shy nervous and I cannot speak the other person would have not had the faith to receive their own healing what would happen if my cousin David in a sauna you know seen another young man who sits there who's very quiet and reservative and said you know what I I don't want to bug him and bother him and talk to him about anything but David didn't do that what David did is he opened his mouth and he shared his testimony and little did he know the hand of God started to move and touch brother Lewis and today Lewis is a follower of Jesus Christ that's exactly what the Lord wants to do with people that we are praying for and people that we are sharing the faith with. Don't think God's hand is going to move if you're going to keep your mouth shut. We cannot sit here and think God's revival is going to come because Jesus died, Holy Spirit came. We're going to zip our lip, not invite nobody, not pray for souls, not praise God like we got it and not proclaim. And if God wants it, God will give it. The devil is a liar revival is not gonna ever ever happen like that look at the churches that keep their mouths shut God keeps his hand closed look at those that keep their mouth open and God's hand is open let's be the church that keep our mouth open now when we pray we pray loud when we pray we pray in faith and when we pray we pray in all kinds of fire we proclaim we praise and something's gonna happen God's ear is gonna hear and God's hand is gonna move for the glory of God can somebody say amen